Welcome to our reading group. And today we'll talk about eval based message passing with Artur. Let's go. So again, um, thank you for having me. It's really great, great pleasure to, to be here and uh, discuss our work. So this will be about our uh, recent ICML paper on a technique called eval message passing. And in a nutshell, this is a new type of JNN layer, uh, uh, specifically in molecular applications or more generally point cloud applications that allows the JNN to learn uh, messages without any limit on the distance. Um, and to do so, it, it makes use of a very old and classic technique called Ewald summation. And so it's really somewhere in between physics and machine learning. Um, and yeah, I hope there will be something for people from all of these backgrounds today. Um, and well, so this just for the context, this was part of, of my thesis work uh, at, in Stefan Gunnemann's group. Um, so Stefan's group works uh, mostly on reliable machine learning methods uh, on graph structured data as well as temporal data. So this in includes things like uh, robustness, uncertainty estimation, but well, we also do uh, applications to the natural sciences, such as this one here. And I myself, being a theoretical physicist by background, really enjoy doing things which are at this melting pot of many different disciplines. Um, also important to say, of course, this work would have been impossible without my great co-authors. So there was uh, Johannes Gasteiger, um, who is now at Google Research, uh, as well as Nicolas Gau, who is a PhD student in Stefan's group. They also advised me for this thesis project out of which this paper arose. Okay, so let's start. Just so you have an overview, I will start uh, with, well, the type of problem setting that we're really looking at, just so we have a sharp definition of this. And um, I will then afterwards discuss the background, um, a few notions, particularly regarding materials, periodic systems, just so everyone is on the same page. Afterwards, get to our main technique of Ewald message passing. Later on, discuss uh, our empirical studies that evaluate the effectiveness of this technique. And finally, I will draw a conclusion about what Ewald message passing really achieves in a practical setting. So, well, the problem setting is really a very elementary one. So we have our data set. Um, every sample is really a molecule, a molecular structure. And uh, the inputs are very simple. They're just the atom types, which I denote by Z, and the atom positions, which I denote by R here. Um, and the targets, which we predict, are an energy for the entire structure, as well as a set of forces, uh, one acting on each atom. Of course, you can use these predictions for a lot of downstream tasks. I think many of you know this already, so you can for instance, find minima in the local in the free energy landscape or stationary states. This would correspond to to, to um, equilibrium states or transition states of the structure. You can also integrate these force predictions for the atoms, so integrate Newton, Newton's equations in order to get dynamical insights into these structures. So really, a lot of things you can do with this, but we only focus on this elementary task. Um, also note that really our inputs are the most basic ones, so we don't use any electronic structure input. We also don't use any handcrafted information like chemical bond orders and the like. Um, so really our model simply learns this functional relationship from atom types, atom positions to forces and per molecule energies. And of course, perhaps some of you might also ask why we want to learn this at all. I, I mean, there are of course techniques which compute these targets from first principles. That's how we make our data sets. Famously, there's, there's density functional theory, DFT, and it's many variants and it does a great job of calculating these but it has a pretty sharp scaling in the structural size so just basic implementations of dft have a cubic scaling there are works with for instance actually proposed linearly scaling dft functionals but really if you look at the practical state of the art right now it's it's still very rare that these first principles techniques like DFT would be applied to molecular dynamic settings that would, for instance, be interesting for a, let's say, soft matter physicist or colloid chemist. So really, with machine learning, with the speed up that we can achieve over DFT, this becomes, I think, a very interesting kind of problem setting. And um, now let's, let's look very briefly at how the models look like that we consider. 
So, well, Hannes told me that you are already quite familiar with, with MPNN, um, so I will go over this very briefly, because MPNN is not always the same. Well, there are edge-based MPNNs, there are atom-to-atom -atom message passing MPNNs. I'm really just considering this very simple case where I pass messages between different atoms in the structure. So our type of models that are interesting for event message passing look like this. We have our positions, we have our atom types, and then we embed our atom types onto some high dimensional vector, right? This is our, these are our atom embeddings. And then we have at the first step, just the local atom specific information. So no interactions yet. And now we can do the interactions by first of all, defining a notion of proximity on our system. So we do this always using a cutoff. There are of course these approaches which, which do not use the whole 3D positional information, but just like for instance, predefined bonds, which are already part of the input. We do not consider this setting. We always look at the standard way of doing a cutoff graph, which you can always do with the positional information available. So we define this and then we pass our messages on this cutoff graph. Um, and well, we um, accumulate them somehow. Um, we just, in this case, sum them. It just has to be something that's permutation invariant under the atom labels, because obviously atoms don't have labels. So this should not depend on our labeling of the atoms. Um, so we do this, and then we um, kind of combine this local information, which we have from the embeddings with the globe, with the sort of neighborhood information that we have from the message passing in order to get our new atom embeddings. And this is something that we can, of course, now just repeat. And also we, of course, generate output from the atom embeddings in these various steps. Uh, we might do this only at the end. We might also do this in between. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but we do we use some sort of output function in order to map our embeddings onto an energy value for each atom. And we then sum these energy values for each atom in order to get the final energy output. Um, so this is, for instance, how we would get energies here. Yeah, so now, so far, I've been very abstract with the, with the messages, just the general MBNN framework, but really um, Ewald message passing generalizes a very specific type of message passing called continuous filter convolutions. So what we do here in order to construct these messages in this case is just consider the set of basis functions around some atoms. So for instance, we might have one basis function called phi1, psi1, psi2, Psi three, so these are just sort of some radial basis functions around the atom, and then we can just build linear combinations of these in order to get some kind of filters, radial filters, which we can then put over our atoms. And the sort of effect that we want to achieve is that uh, each filter kind of selects certain atoms in space, while it selects, uh, while it does not select other atoms in space. So for instance, the first filter here might select out atom J, but not atom K, whereas the second filter might select atom K, but not atom J. And this way, we have kind of the filter for each component of the embeddings. And by taking the component-wise product of the embedding values and the filter values, we get this kind of very flexible processing of the mutual arrangement of our atoms. And also importantly, it's differentiable. So we can just differentiate the energy output with respect to the positions and also get the force output. Yeah, so this is how we do our message passing um, in the case of con continuous filter convolutions. Very importantly, just so I already mentioned this here, Ewald message passing can be used with much more complex kinds of message passing. This is just the kind of message passing that Ewald message passing generalizes. But we can use Ewald message passing together with base models that are even edge based. Uh, in fact, we did this with the DimeNet and GemNet models. Um, but for the definition of Ewald message passing, we only need this simple kind of continuous filter convolution message passing. Yeah, so this is fine and good. I think you can see it's quite a flexible way to process the structural geometry. However, there's this one problem that the filters have the position space cutoff. So really if an atom here, it's called L is outside of this cutoff region. Well, there's just no way in which this information would reach atom I in, in a single message passing step. This is 
very different from the actual physics because in many cases we have long range interactions such as uh, electrostatic or Coulomb interactions as well as van der Waals or dispersion interactions. And these of course don't stop at any particular cutoff. They really have this power law shape that uh, decays very slowly with distance. And so you might argue, okay, maybe our neural network can sort of learn this with several message passing steps, not just one, uh, because of course, after the second message passing step, it already sees next neighbor information and so forth. However, there are very um, well studied cases um, and mechanisms which lead really to the failure of, of GNNs for interactions which, which go over several edges. Uh, so there's this famous over squashing bottleneck, which leads um, to the fact that an exponentially um, increasing receptive field really with the number of involved message passing steps is compressed into fixed size vectors. And there are lots of reasons to argue why GNNs are not really good at passing message, uh, messages uh, over several edges. So this is why our Ewald message passing approach really takes a very different perspective and and really passes information from the entire structure in a single message passing step. And the key to this is the technique of Ewald summation. Um, and we will present this in, in just a minute. Uh, first of all, let me introduce a few background notions just so the Ewald message passing goes a bit more smoothly. So quick excursion uh, just into the context of periodic boundary conditions. Now, so far, I've always talked about molecules, so kind of finite arrangements of atoms in space. But of course, there is the case of materials where, um, where we have an infinite collection of atoms, really. But we can sort of approximate this infinite collection by a finite set of atoms that is just kind of periodically tiled throughout space. And it's tiled in a way that um, so the atom embeddings hi, hj, they just get uh, mapped to other embeddings at translations, which are on the supercell lattice. So the supercell lattice, it's kind of a, some three vectors. They define this parallelepiped, and every integer translation on this lattice defines a new supercell where the system just looks the same as in any other supercell. And now, this cutoff construction that we had in, in the aperiodic case really simply kind of generalizes to this case. Namely, we just um, basically only consider the embeddings for a single supercell because the embeddings in other supercells will just be the same um, due to the periodic boundary conditions. So they're redundant. We don't store these explicitly. But if an atom really has atoms from several neighboring supercells inside its cutoff, then we just draw multiple edges between, between these supercell atoms. And this way, we get um, this kind of very nice uh, generalization of a distance cutoff to the but periodic set. Why do we have this periodicity in our actual problem? So um, this is uh, really just depends on the data set, right? So there are, um, we studied both periodic and aperiodic data. If we just have molecules, we just have an aperiodic structure. So all is good. We don't need all of this. But in uh, the case of OC20, for instance, this models kind of a surface where we sort of dock little organic molecules, we stick them to the surface. Um, and there we have this extended nature of the system. And for this, we need uh, the periodic boundary conditions. And mm -hmm. the why, I mean, maybe your question is why, why we need this periodicity. And this is just because we do want to model an infinite problem with a finite set of, of quantities. So a finite set of embeddings, a finite set of edges between these atoms. And we can achieve this simply by saying, all right, the system repeats in the same way um, in, in the neighborhood. So these periodic boundary conditions that you're introducing here, they are only relevant to the case when we actually have something periodic. Um, so actually, um, yes, uh, naively speaking, yes. However, there is this thing that we do apply Ewald message passing to aperiodic systems as well. And this is sort of a problem because Ewald summation is actually just defined for periodic boundary conditions. However, what we can always do is we can assume the supercell is really big and kind of the neighboring supercells are really far away from our supercell and don't really interact with it. And this way we can kind of artificially reintroduce 
periodicity into the problem in order to apply about message passing without really affecting the physical quantities which we are considering. Mm -hmm. Is that so, helpful? Yes, this is um, this is helpful. Or let's say it is mathematically needed in order to apply Ewald summation. Yes, but um, is it then in this case also helpful to apply Ewald summation? Uh, yes, it is because the point is why we need the periodicity for for Ewald uh, summation is that we are it's, it's a Fourier space technique. So we need some notion of of Fourier space of Fourier modes which yeah. which we are considering. And and as you all know, when I have a periodic function, I can expand it in terms of these Fourier modes. Yeah, but that's right. That's the explanation of why we need the um, periodicity to apply Ewald summation. Yes. So why do we want Ewald summation if uh, we have something non-periodic? But ah. I suppose that will uh, likely come up or you can talk about it now if you want. Very intuitively speaking, I will of course come to this in detail, is that the Fourier modes um, are sort of completely delocalized in space. They're just, uh, they, they don't have any region to which they are confined, but they are really plane waves extending through all of space. And this sort of nature of Fourier modes really leads to this whole non-local character of Ewald summation. So really this Fourier part of Ewald summation that we will be considering in just a minute leads to, to a way of passing messages that is just completely non-local in space. And, and this is very intuitively, uh, let, let's say, why we need the Ewald summation in order to pass messages without the distance limit. Uh, also empirically, I will show you later that actually Ewald message passing does lead to improving predictions on, mm -hmm. on aperiodic structures. Uh, yes. But I really hope it, it will become a bit more clear um, in a few slides. But of course, if you still have questions or if anyone else has questions on this on this particular thing um, that we're discussing now, just come back to me at any point. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you for the good question. So now we have this kind of conventional way of passing messages with a distance cutoff, we have sort of generalized this to periodic systems, but uh, this is not what Ewald message passing, what the long range part of Ewald message passing will do. In fact, it will not use a, a distance cutoff at all. This is just how regular models which use a distance cutoff can be applied to the periodic setting. Now, I already said that uh, we look at this sort of uh, Fourier um, expansion. We need this um, to, to do uh, Ewald uh, message passing. So let me quickly um, define how this looks like. Sorry, um, this is one slide too far. Here, uh, let's just focus on the lattice. I have, I have put away the atoms now. Uh, we don't need them right now. Um, so if we have any sort of periodic function on this lattice, um, let's say some from R3 to R and it's periodic. So it means that any translation of this function on the lattice maps the function into itself. Um, then, well, we want a Fourier expansion of this function. Um, and now the question is which K, so which wave vectors K does this whole sum run over? Just for context, I'm using complex exponentials here. Um, Perhaps many of you may be more familiar with the sine cosine representation. And internally, of course, I use the sine cosine representation, but the notation is just more compact with this complex kind of notation. Uh, but it's really the same. So uh, I have these three modes. Now the question is what, what uh, frequencies does the sum include? And well, clearly, um, the scalar product uh, between the frequencies and any translation vector on the lattice uh, has to vanish simply because it has to be a multiple of two pi such that this exponential gets just a multiple of a two pi phase, so a vanishing phase really, in front of the exponential function. Um, and this condition that we have um, sort of leaves us with another lattice structure. Um, and it's this one, it's called the reciprocal lattice. Uh, yes, Hannes, you have a question. So why are we, maybe you go a slide back, why are we considering a periodic function now, right? We have, for example, a lattice and we have forces coming from the, the neighboring atom. Mm -hmm. uh, of, we are from the atom in the uh, neighboring cell and from the neighboring neighboring cell and so on. But yes. these forces are not periodic in the sense of them all being the same, right? They're all um scaled depending on the distance and the distance is always different 
That's correct. Um, indeed, uh, this is this is true. So so there is no nothing that would help us there. However, um, this is more more precisely written down in the paper. I won't do the whole calculations in this talk. But what you what you will do in the end is that you can consider the message sum. So really really this sum of all the neighboring atom um, atom messages, uh, which is really an infinite sum in this in this periodic case. You can um, consider this a function of the atom position, right? Uh, because because uh, it implicitly depends on the position of the receiving target atom, of course. And this is really a periodic function because when you translate that atom position into another neighboring supercell, then I think it's clear just visually why the messages yes. The message sum will be the same. So this is a periodic function, and this is yeah. uh, which we indeed can uh, expand in terms of Fourier modes. And as I said, I won't do the whole calculations here, but in the, in the paper you see that this Fourier expansion really leads to um, the entire uh, Ewald message passing formalism. Yeah. So so okay. So we have now our nice periodic function because if we translate to the next cell, then we get exactly the same value. We want exactly. a free series expansion. Let's exactly. continue. Yes, exactly. Um, so this is this is how it looks like. So so uh, now we also see how our modes have to look like, which k are sort of part of this Fourier series expansion, because this kind of periodicity condition leads to only a certain set of frequencies which are really compatible with our supercell lattice. Maybe you can think of this in analogy to the one-dimensional case. So you all know overtones uh, and music. So when you have a certain periodic interval and you want to expand the function in terms of its Fourier modes, then really you have a base frequency, which is sort of the ground tone. And then you have all the multiple multiples of this frequency, which are part of the Fourier expansion. So it is kind of a one-dimensional lattice that we're considering here. And really, in this three-dimensional case, we have the same but in three dimensions. We have a three-dimensional lattice, and we have three base frequencies. These frequencies are now, of course, vectors, because they are sort of the vectors corresponding to the phase directions of our plane waves. And these base frequencies are W1, W2, W3, which you can see here. And now each base frequency really corresponds to a 2 pi phase shift along one of the basis directions and no phase shift along the other basis directions. And every other frequency that enters our Fourier expansion is uh, some integer linear combination of these three basis frequencies. So you do see that we have this different lattice structure. It's now a lattice in Fourier space, not in real space. And it's called the reciprocal lattice because it does have this very nice relationship uh, with the basic supercell lattice. Um, one follows from the other really and you can just very it's, it's just basically in your algebra you can verify that you can get the reciprocal lattice vectors using these relations uh, from the supercell lattice vectors it's really just this two pi phase shift condition that we must have for the scalar product between the wave vectors and the translation vectors on the supercell lattice yeah so this is uh, this is really this notion that I wanted to introduce of the reciprocal lattice. Do you have any questions regarding this so far? So we now have a method for translating our um, um, for translating positions represented in our supercell lattice to positions represented in the reciprocal lattice, which are inputs to our um, to our Fourier decompose, decomposed periodic function. That's correct, yes. So really we can, um, this translation of inputs, uh, I will make this more precise in, in a minute. Uh, really you can represent the entire set of atom positions and atom embeddings that really defines the state of our model in a certain layer. You can translate this into a completely equivalent representation, which now sits on this reciprocal lattice in Fourier mm. space, and this is really where Ewald message passing operates. So this is also why, why I went, spent a bit of time introducing this notion, because it is really uh, fundamental to understanding Ewald message passing. Okay, so if there's no further questions. 
Okay, there isn't, I think. Uh, so I will just go on now. Well, in the chat we have, will the process be sensitive to the cell size? Can I use the same parameters and embeddings it is it, when I change significantly the cell size? Um, yes, so indeed, uh, this is a very good question. Um, you have to, maybe I can come back to this in a few slides. So you do have, of course, to adapt your hyperparameters to the cell size and uh, this, it really depends on the concrete uh, way in which I build these Fourier space filters afterwards. If I have uh, expected invariances with regards to supercell doubling and stuff like that, or if I don't. But yeah, I will come back to this in a few slides. Uh, this is, of course, a very, very important thing to consider here. Nice. And really, nice. really, uh, if you if you con if you make a larger supercell, you have a sort of corresponding behavior in Fourier space. So if you double your supercell, for instance then suddenly you will have half frequencies in between your previous frequencies and really your, your, your reciprocal lattice will do the opposite sort of transformation. So, so doubling one supercell vector in real space means halving a reciprocal lattice vector in Fourier space. So they do have this, this sort of reciprocal relationship. This is also where the name really comes from. So let's go on. Now we can finally talk about eval summation. Um, I will talk about this in a just uh, physical context right now. And really, eval message passing will be a simple, formal kind of substitution of equations once we have this physical sort of way of thinking really settled. So let's consider the following question. We want to sum a um, Coulomb potential uh, of ions in a kind of periodically repeating structure. This could, for instance, be an ion crystal if you want to be concrete. and so the Coulomb potential is this type of type of uh, function where you have the charge. So it's 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 proportional to to the source charge and it's inversely proportional to the distance. So you really see that this phi e s, which is which is the distance um, to the power of minus one, has a very long tail with distance. And this this is a problem because if we just want to sum this Coulomb potential um, with a distance cutoff. This is really not a viable option because first of all, this sum isn't even absolutely convergent. This is, well, definitely a problem, I would say. Uh, we have to find some order of really summing up these, these charges, which is physically informed. And even if we have this kind of physically sane summation order, it still converges extremely slowly. So using a distance cutoff is, is not a good way of, of summing up this QA over D minus one type of Coulomb potential in an ionic lattice. So we can do something else. Um, Ewald came up with this kind of approach. It's, it's a very smart trick, I would say. So we can replace the set of point charges by a set of two composite charges. Uh, so, so we ba basically put an, a Gaussian cloud of inverse charge around our point charges, around each of them. And then we sort of undo this whole thing just by adding back the opposite Gaussian clouds of point clouds of charge. So we have this type of decomposition. I think you can all see how this how this um, gets back to our original distribution of charge, and we can just equivalently try to decompose our potentials. So we have the full one over R profile, and now we can look at these composite entities and how their potential profile looks like. So we have the short range charges. And really, if you go far away from such a Gaussian plus a point cloud, you will see that this profile vanishes um, to zero because from far away, the Gaussian just completely screens out the central point charge. So no charge will be visible. Um, and on the other hand, for the long range part, now this is really where we do have this long range behavior because from far away, um, this uh, you will just have the regular one over our profile. Because from far away, the Gaussian will look just like a point charge. So, so it will have the long Coulomb tail, but really this blurring of the point charges to a Gaussian of the same charge really means that high frequency components of this potential are sort of blurred away. And this also leads to the vanishing singularity, uh, which we have at r equals zero. So, so we have- Why does full on the very left not have a crying face? Um, Ah, well, because it's sort of trivial that this is that this is problematic. I didn't I didn't bother putting okay. the crying face there, <laughs> but it has a crying face as well. It should have. We can't, as as we saw just just before, 
it's really not possible to sum this up with a distance cutoff. So very big crying phase there. And um, yeah, so, so we have a happy phase with the short range profile because this one we can just sum up with a distance cutoff, but the long range one kind of just, we kind of just shift the problem so far to the long range yeah. profile, which sort of contains this long range cool on tail. So what do we do now? Well, what we can do is uh, observe that if we do the Fourier transform of this whole thing, then we see that this potential profile is really short range in Fourier space. This has to do with this blurring of the point charges to corresponding Gaussians, because this blurring acts a bit like a Gaussian filter, so it just sort of cuts away the high frequency components of the potential. And this is how we get a short range potential in Fourier space. And what we can do next, and this is a bit of Fourier analysis, which you will find in detail in our paper, but essentially you can just rewrite the sum over uh, all the atoms in the lattice. Uh, you can rewrite this over as into a sum over just the supercell atoms. Um, this is what I call SC here. And the rest of the sum then is rewritten into a Fourier space sum, which now goes over the reciprocal lattice that I introduced previously. And the important thing here is that you can now see this Fourier transformed profile inside the sum. And this is exactly what we want to have because now we can just cut off this sum of our frequencies at a cutoff, which is which we can do because the Fourier space profile is short range. And now you can see happy smileys in, in each of the cases because now every sum is truncated at a certain rather small number of terms. And this is how we sum up a cooler potential. It's a bit more complicated than that, really. There are terms that have to co correct for self-interaction of charges and, and things like that, but all of this is really not important for, for Ewald message passing. So in a nutshell, this is really how Ewald summation works. And now we can just really introduce our method already. You, this is maybe a bit, uh, a bit much at the moment, but it will become clear just in a while how this translates to machine yeah, learning. Then maybe have a quick recap, right? We have... Yes. This period, uh, we, we have our interactions not only with the stuff in our own cell, but we also have interactions with stuff in other cells. And we want to uh, yeah, calculate these in as well. And now, if we just sum up all of the interactions, then we would have a divergent sum and also other issues. What was the other issue? Uh, so it's it's not absolutely convergent. Um, that's one issue. This is something that's specific for the one over R profile. It's not in general. So in fact, for instance, for a one over R to the power three profile or something like that, yeah. this was not be an issue anymore. But it can be an issue for certain profiles like one over R. But the mo way more important issue is really that the sum converges extremely slowly because no matter how large we make our cutoff, there will still be a very significant portion of this profile tail kind of not included in the cutoff region. We will we just cannot really omit these longer range contributions. And this mm -hmm. is where about message passing comes into play because we can much more cleverly kind of write the sum as a sum of two terms. One of them is short ranged in position space. One of them is short range in Fourier space and sum up each of them the corresponding cutoff. And now we um, do this decomposition because of that. And in the decomposition, we, yeah, the short range interactions or in the, the decomposition is short range and long range interactions and the short range interactions, we can very simply just choose a cutoff and only add up a few and just do that. And that's a good approximation now. And exactly. for yeah. long range stuff, then we do uh, your Fourier trick where you, uh, transform your invented charges into Fourier space. You um, th then do the cutoff of the summation in in the frequency space instead of in the in the coordinate space, so to say, or in, instead of the our Cartesian original space. And now, yeah, we we have this and can just add them up or something like that. Yes, so we can transform back and add them up. Exactly. So, okay. so yeah, in a way, this this sum here, which you can see now, is is just already the same sum as I had previously in position space. It's just expressed now in terms of our Fourier space quantities. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a very good way to to summarize it, really. 
And then Clemens is asking, do we have some intuitive picture of the Fourier space cutoff? And like, can we do something now? We have our, our guitar string and we start vibrating it with some frequency and we ignore, yeah, I'm not sure. Do you have something? Uh, yes, so I will come back to this actually on the next slide. Um, okay, so that's a good question. Um, yeah, I hope if, if this is not clear after the next slide, then just, just get back to me um, and we can talk about this more. Okay, then uh, before we get on, uh, do you will you lose some words on the efficiency of the Fourier transform later? Ah, uh, so well, I can uh, lose a few general words on the computational scaling of our approach. Uh, just I can already say that yes. this work really just introduces the the basic method of evaluate message passing without any tricks like fast Fourier transforms and things like that. So we just use the standard Fourier transform. Uh, we will still see that this has has a beneficial effect on scaling if you compare it to just uh, you know, message passing without any distance cutoff in position space. Okay, let's move these more general questions to later. And yes. one more understanding question here from the chat. Why does adding a cloud of inverse charge to the point charges make the real space interactions short ranged? Okay, yeah, that's that's a, that's kind of a physical thing, really. Um, so uh, let me get back. So the idea is that if I surround my point charges with this cloud of opposite charge, then if I'm very close to my point charges, I will be deep inside this, this cloud of the opposite Gaussian charge, and it, I will really not see it. There's this kind of property of uh, Coulomb profiles and really more generally of the Poisson equation that anything that's outside my radius uh, at which I am near to the near to the central charge doesn't matter at all to the potential. And in fact, just once I get get away from my charge, then I will sort of see the surrounding cloud of opposite charge. And if I'm really far away, then all the opposite charge will be inside my sort of radius uh, at which I am away from the from the central point charge. And it will just completely screen off this this central charge because I will have the same opposite charge around my central charge. And this, this means that the potential just drops off to zero. And only once I get inside this cloud, I, I, see, I see the same sort of potential that I would see from the point charge. So this is really a property of, of electrostatics here. Um, I hope this, this helped a bit, but if there's a follow-up question, uh, we can also talk about that. Let's continue for now, I would say. Okay. Um... Also, this is just just to say this is not really important for Ebert message passing. Um, also, I will come to this on the next slide. This was just a physical example of how Ebert summation is traditionally used in physics, but it's not really important to have all these intuitions about electrostatics. Um, so let me get to Ebert message passing. Um, there we go. So what, what we learn in general from Ewald's summation is that if we have message functions that are delocalized in position space, but they are kind of short range in Fourier space, we can rewrite this into a Fourier space sum, and then we can efficiently take the sum with a frequency cutoff. And what we can do now is consider a purely formal analogy, really. We can replace our point charges, what was previously our point charges, we can replace this by the atom embeddings now. And what was previously our potential profiles, so the Coulomb 1 over R profile and, and the, so the short range profile and the corresponding long range profile, we just replaced this by filters, which we learn. So we have the short range filter, uh, which is now any learned filter, but with a distance cutoff. And we have a long range filter, which is a Fourier space filter. And this is really the part that, that is now new. It's a filter in Fourier space that has a frequency cutoff. And uh, now we can just literally do the same sort of formal calculation, but with these uh, analogous substitutions, so to say. And we do arrive at two different kinds of, of message passing. One is the sum of our short range messages with the distance truncated filters. Um, this is just our plain standard convolutional filter message passing, as we all know and love it. 
Uh, and then we have our second kind of message passing. This is the new type of message passing, which really computes something which is the long range part of an eval sum. So we have our filters in Fourier space, and and well, we do this we do this type of message passing. And an important thing to mention before I go into details is that uh, so it's a conceptual difference really. Eval summation uh, considers a fixed sort of a known physical potential such as one over R, so cooler profile for instance, and then it looks kind of for a suitable decomposition of that profile. In our case, we did this intuitively using these Gaussian charges and opposite Gaussian charges. It really imposes such a, such a decomposition uh, as known, and then it can compute um, an eval sum using these sort of short range and long range profiles. In the okay. case of eval message passing. Mm -hmm. So to be, we really just take the idea from eval summation and now we do what we always did or short range message passing but you're saying ah oh, why well why don't you just also have additional messages where you do a Fourier transform and then just do exactly the same as we do in our usual message passing but just with the coordinates in Fourier space Absolutely. So really, it's here. It's a just an ansatz, so to say. It's a it's a free form ansatz. Um, and so so basically, we don't learn. We don't seek a decomposition for a fixed kind of filters. But instead, what we really do is we we suppose that our messages can be parametrized in in the form of an eval sum. We don't know these filters, but we learn them. And and we learn them using two kinds of filters: the distance truncated filters and the frequency truncated filters. So right. this is an important conceptual difference, really. Um, and this is why also these intuitions about Gaussians and, and so forth, they are not really essential to understand um, eval message passing. Uh, I'm see, I see there is a question in the audience. Let's uh, go for it. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a question regarding the long range message passing. It seems in the short range, we, we sum over like these B nodes, which are within a certain cutoff, I guess. But do we then in the long range message passing for every atom sum over like all atoms in the like in the one cell or that's wouldn't... correct, exactly. So now now we can constrain the sum instead of so this is also why we can do this at all, because it's really a finite sum that just goes over a single supercell now. This is the B in brackets that you see in the sum below. And why it's a B in brackets is it's sort of an equivalence class of atoms, really, because all the translated atoms in other supercells, of course, have the same atom embeddings as the atoms in one particular supercell. And now our sum only extends over the atom embeddings in one particular supercell. And the rest of the sum that kind of puts in all the you know, um, other supercells is now instead written as a Fourier space sum over the reciprocal letters of frequencies. I Does see. this answer your question? Uh, I think so. I'm just wondering in case of aperiodic uh, systems where you still apply this thing, and let's say we have some aperiodic large molecule, mm -hmm. would, wouldn't this amount to like uh, really a lot of summations because for every atom we would have to sum over every other atom, which kind of uh, uh, yeah. might be nice in those cases? Yeah, so it's a bit like I said previously, what you do is uh, you kind of pretend there is a supercell, just a pretty big one, uh, or it's like a suffic sufficiently big one. And I will also come come to this on on a future slide, actually. Um, so so yeah, I think uh, so. My understanding of the question was a different one that that it is about and not about how do we now turn it into a periodic problem, but let's even say we just have a very large supercell. Then isn't it problematic here that we need to sum now oh. over all the stuff? Oh. In the ah, I see. I see now your question now. Uh, yes, but th this is the same really uh, if you consider just normal message passing with the distance cutoff, because if you have a very large molecule, you do have to compute messages to all the atoms. Uh, so so you, all, you always have at least a linear scaling in, in the number of atoms in your supercell. And in this case, the linear scaling comes in the number of atoms really comes from, from the sum over a supercell. So, so but but then again, um, we do have this frequency part of the sum can be constantly constrained by this cutoff. So, 
So this is um, really the same type of cost situation as we would have with regular message passing as well. Is that clear or? Yeah, I think now it's clear. Thank you. Yeah, so just come back if there's any more questions. Um, but but really, yeah, so so we do this. This is something that we can parallelize if, if we have. Uh, so if we have at least, let's say we're operating at sufficient uh, with a with a GPU that has sufficient VRAM, we can really use it. Then we can do this atom part, the supercell sum part. We can do this in parallel. So it's it's really not much more tragic than it would be in the case of just regular um, distance truncated messages. Also, now I can say something about intuition of the frequency cutoff because we had this question earlier. So really what this amounts to now um, of doing a frequency cutoff is uh, limiting the resolution of our filters, specifically those filters which we learn in Fourier space. Of course, you could write this Ewald sum in position space again, um, kind of undo this whole thing, uh, this whole Fourier analysis computations that we did to arrive at this form. And then it would sort of, again, be a sum over a position space filter. However, this filter, which we learn in Fourier space, has no limit in distance, um, but it has a limit in resolution. So really, this frequency cutoff tells you that the filters which we learn can only change up to that fast in, in, in space. Uh, and, and this kind of limit is given by the maximum frequency that can still enter our Fourier sum. So, so really, the short range and long range message passing are complementary in nature. So the short range filters are limited in distance, and the long range filters are not limited in distance, but limited in resolution. I hope this, this gets a bit of intuition on, on what the frequency cutoff is doing. So now I would get to the concrete, uh, well, to the detailed, let's say, analysis of this long range message passing that we have just derived uh, from a formal substitution of Ewald summation. So really what we can see here is a kind of three part structure that our uh, message passing has. So first we compute this inner sum. This is uh, where the sum over the supercell comes in. And what the output of the sum is now a bunch of quantities that has the same dimension as the atom embeddings. However, it sits on the reciprocal lattice sides now instead of in position space. We call these quantities uh, structure factor embeddings. This is just because there's an analogous quantity in crystallography, which is called the structure factor. It's kind of the same thing, but with charges instead of atom embeddings. And so we have this we have this Fourier space representation now, and it's really equivalent to the set of atom embeddings plus their positions, because if you think of these atom embeddings as a kind of discrete charge density, really, so you think of it as a distribution of charge that's supported at the atom positions, and now you you perform the sum. This is really just a Fourier transform um, of this charge distribution. And, and what we get with uh, um, out of this, so the structure factor embeddings are just the Fourier transform of this. Um, so this is how we get an equivalent representation Fourier space. It is a non-local representation now because um, it, it sits really, it's local in Fourier space, uh, but non-local in position space. And now what we do next, uh, you can see this with this uh, dot in the circle. This is the component-wise product, by the way. So we do, again, the component-wise product, but now in Fourier space. And we just do this k-wise. So we learn some filter in Fourier space. We do this multiplication. And then afterwards, we sum things back. We sort of scatter things back into position space by the sum which goes over all the structure factor embeddings now times the filter. Um, and this is how we get back to quantities in position space. So yeah, this is this is um, sort of the general structure of how this looks like. And notice just um, in general that there's this all to one nature of our message passing because every atom in the structure influences every other atom in the structure after a single such message passing step. And really the, the, the control of our cost comes from the fact that we don't consider all the structure factor embeddings of which there would be infinitely many, but we sort of constrain this to just this cutoff region in Fourier space where we explicitly compute our structure factor embeddings. And this, by the way, is also a type of cost graining scheme because really if the 
whole set of structure fact embeddings is a, a, an equivalent representation of our atom embeddings plus their positions, then this truncated representation kind of cuts away all the high frequency information. And it sort of only leaves the slowly varying features. And, and so this is also another interpretation of the frequency cutoff. So now there was the question about the aperiodic case. And I already said, we essentially, we kind of pretend that there is a supercell, just a large one. Um, you can also see this in, in Fourier space. So if you have uh, our structure factor embeddings uh, assigned to the positions k on the reciprocal lattice, then now let's think about what happens if you don't have a reciprocal lattice because you don't have any periodic boundary conditions. Really, you can think of this as a limit of an infinitely large supercell. Um, and, and, and the reciprocal lattice, because it, it does the opposite thing as the supercell lattice, it kind of becomes a continuum of, of frequencies. So really, the structure factor embeddings now become continuous functions from the R3 to the d-dimensional complex numbers. Um, I hope it's clear that these are now complex quantities because we have this, these E functions, uh, complex exponentials in front of them. And now, of course, we can't really compute with continuous functions, so we have to discretize them somehow. And our approach is really to put a sort of grid of voxels into the Fourier space of our system and discretize this continuous function on a voxel grid. Um, and on the left, you can really see how this looks like. So in the upper row, you can see a continuous sort of structure factor function that we actually got uh, by evaluating one of our models, it was GemNet T, um, on a random structure of uh, the aperiodic OS62 data set. And then we looked at the first layer, so the embedding layer, and just took a random slice through one of the embedding components. And this is how we got this plot. So it's, uh, you can see the amplitude as well as the complex phase. And it is a, comp it is a function with pretty rich um, features, you could say. And below, you can see our discretized representation. So here, what we do is we choose a, uh, a certain discretization resolution. This is like the size of our voxels in, in Fourier space. And this is the resolution that we actually use in, in our computations here. And as you see, the essential structures are really preserved in this, in this representation. And if you think of all of this back in position space, it is really very much uh, similar to just saying you have a big supercell because then if you reintroduce periodic boundary conditions, you do have, again, some sort of lattice in Fourier space, just a pretty finely resolved one because, because you need to choose a, at least a sufficiently large supercell there. Another thing is that we need to use a co-rotating frame for our voxel grid, because if we now think of rotating the structure, then in Fourier space, the structure factor function would also rotate. And we would get aliasing effects uh, because we have this sort of 3D grid of voxels now. And to avoid this and um, remain rotationally invariant, what we do is we compute a PCA frame um, in, the in, in the point um, cloud of atom positions. Um, and then we just use the PCEA eigenvectors sorted by the eigenvalues in order to have an orthonormal frame that rotates along with the molecule. And in this sort of frame, we then put our voxels, uh, our, our voxel grid and uh, preserve the rotational invariance of our approach. This is all I have to say about the aperiodic case. Now also let's look at our filtering strategies that we actually apply. So we, um, in the, in the aperiodic case, we did uh, something very similar to what con con uh, convolutional filter message passing does in position space. So we want these we want these k space filters, and we just think of having a radial basis uh, set now in Fourier space, not in position space, and then we learn radial filters simply by computing linear combinations of these radial basis functions. And so in, in fact, we use the same radial basis functions as, as uh, should it are used for the Schnett model um, and many others following that as well. Uh, we just use them in Fourier space with a Fourier space cutoff. So, so very simple, really. Uh, for the non-periodic case, we did something different. We also experimented with radial filtering at first, just, just as, in, as in the um, aperiodic case, but we found that it's not so good really to have this constraint of, of radial interactions. The fact is that we do have this 
periodic boundary conditions frame that that we have in the periodic case and it's it, it gives us valuable geometric information because in the oc20 data set for instance we have surface structures which have a surface normal and 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 the rest uh, of the directions and of course the model should know uh, which direction is normal to the surface and which one is not so what we can do instead is we can use the pbc frame uh, which is in uh, Fourier space given by, by our reciprocal lattice equivalently and um, this thing of course rotates with the structure again so we are rotational invariant even though we do no radial filtering anymore and then we just learn sort of coefficients in front of a certain set of reciprocal lattice sites that we include in our computation so Concretely, let's say we have hyperparameters in X and Y and Z. Um, in this case, they would all be one. And we just say, okay, let's take the uh, minus one until one uh, lattice positions away from the origin. And we do this in all directions. And then we sort of get this, this cuboids that you can see here in orange below. And these are the K vectors that we include in our computation. So we don't explicitly use a cutoff anymore but we still sort of uh, constrain the number of frequencies instead by saying, okay, I only look at the first N frequencies in each of the different coordinate directions. And then we simply learn filter weights uh, associated with each of the reciprocal lattice positions and, and we just multiply them K-wise again. And this is how we parameterize our filters in the, in the periodic case of OC20. It's just empirically proved to work better than um, trying to do radial filtering. And also, we, it's important we have a point symmetry constraint because every lattice, regardless of which other symmetries it might have, every lattice is at least point symmetrical. It's easy to think of. If you have three vectors and you just mirror each of them, um, and then you again generate the lattice of all integer translations, it will be the same, of course. So. This point symmetry, it's, it's there in every, um, in every supercell lattice. And now if our model sees a structure that is sort of point, point symmetrically transformed, um, then it should give the same output again. The model should give the same output. And therefore, we in include this point symmetry constraint and really just uh, half the number of parameters that we have to learn for our filters. So this is how we build our filters. And now, Let's step back a bit uh, and take a bit more of a high level view on this again. This was now very precise, very detailed how, how we actually do the filters, but how do we actually integrate this with, with models that are already existent? Um, in fact, we will show this in the empirical part. Evad message passing is, is, a very cheap, um, is a very cheap addition on top of existing models. And we can add it as follows. Let's say we have any kind of existing message passing. So here it could be the atom to atom message passing uh, just because I used this before, but it could also be an edge-based edge, edge -based message passing. Really anything you want, as long as you generate atom embeddings at some point of the message passing process. And then you have our long range message passing, which is just the thing that we considered before. Um, now, this basically amounts to a complementary kind of message passing that as I already said, is unconstrained in distance, but instead constrained in resolution. And now what I can do is just add both message sums to each other. I really just, just perform an addition of, of both results. And this way I get updated atom embeddings that include both the um, information from the perhaps very detailed but distance constrained message passing and the perhaps less constrained, uh, less complex, but, um, non, but, but, uh, but long range uh, type of Ewald message passing that I have. So uh, of long range message passing. So, Ewald message passing is really um, the combined use of both a long range message sum, as I described before, together with any, any really um, short ranged um, message passing uh, procedure. And now the hypothesis, the hypothesis here is that if I use both message passing schemes together, then I will get both better energy predictions and better force predictions. Um, now, really, this is this is a, a hypothesis. So let's see uh, how well this works out in practice. First of all, I quickly talk about our baselines and data sets. So as baselines, we used uh, two node-based models, which just do atom-to-atom -atom message passing. Uh, these are the Schnett and PyNN uh, models. I think they are both very well known, especially the Schnett model. And then we also looked at edge-based models. 
These are the more performant models usually. So, so DimeNet++ and GemNet T. Um, and these together provide a uh, quite variable selection of models that are currently in use. Of course, it's not a full kind of exhaustive uh, selection, but I think it provides some starting point of different models. And then, of course, on top of these, we now add our Ewald message passing and see how, how this influences the model predictions. Then um, regarding data sets, we have, as I already said, an aperiodic and periodic data set. So our periodic data set is also 20. This is a very challenging data set that contains a very large amount of structures, uh, around 133 million. Um, and each of them is essentially a small organic molecule on top of a surface structure. And the target here is sort of an energy difference that I get by sticking this, this organic molecule on top of the surface uh, when I compare it to isolating it from the surface. So this energy difference is called an adsorption energy, and this is what I'm predicting there. And I'm also predicting forces acting on each atom. These structures can get rather large for, for the standards of this field, so they can have about, about 200 atoms each. Um, and then I also considered um, the, the aperiodic data set of OE62, which contains far less structures, around uh, 62,000. Um, importantly, though, the energies here contain an explicit contribution uh, of van der Waals forces. So we do have this uh, long range effect. And uh, it's really just added on top of the of the energy targets in, in this data set. So we can isolate it from the remaining contributions to the energy. And this will become important in a minute. Also on the left, you can see how an OC20 sample looks like. So we have this kind of surface structure yeah. here. Um, the surface slab and you have the organic molecule on top and you might wonder we have surfaces right so this is a 2d problem not a 3d problem how do we get 3d periodic boundary conditions and really what we do here is we just put a very thick layer of vacuum in the z direction which is the surface normal direction so along this z direction the structures don't really interact with each other a lot anymore and this way we can still model the whole problem with 3d periodic boundary conditions even though we consider a surface physics problem really. Now, I think the most obvious thing to do in order to assess Ewald message passing is how well it performs compared to other things that we might do instead. So for every model that I just listed, we consider four variants. We look just at the vanilla model, sort of the baseline model. Um, then we look at the baseline model on top with Ewald message passing. Uh, so, as I said previously, we just add the Ewald sum uh, with the regular message passing sum in every step, and this is uh, how we incorporate long range information. Then we just look at the vanilla baseline, however, we increase the whole model cutoff uh, from 6 angstrom to 12 angstrom. Um, this is okay, this is actually what we do for OE62. For OC20, what we do is we increase the cutoff by as much as is roughly needed to match the Ewald cost. Uh, this is a little typo on the slide. So the 12 angstrom increases for OE62. The, otherwise, we match it to the Ewald cost. Um, then we also look at the baseline with larger embedding vectors just to see at the, uh, whether the simple increase in the number of free parameters amounts for the, for the improvements that we see. And uh, we also look at a baseline uh, with, with the standard 6 angstrom cutoff. However, uh, in, in place of the Ewald block, we now just look at the standard distance truncated message passing block with a larger cutoff, with a 12 angstrom cutoff. So we kind of replace the whole Ewald summation thing by a standard Schnett block. This is in fact what we do in, in, in practice. So Schnett is a very known baseline uh, which just uses continuous filter convolutions. And we use this, but with a larger cutoff to see whether this additional block that does long range uh, message passing also in a way, um, but now with a distance cutoff, can kind of achieve the same effect as our Ewald message passing. And now on the left, you see our OC20 results. On the right, you see our OE62 results. And in general, what we can say is that Ewald message passing always leads to improvements. In fact, there wasn't any tested setting in which Ewald message passing would be detrimental. Um, and what you see then is that on OC20, it's always the best option. So increasing the cutoff also leads to improvements. However, the trade-off is just not as good when you compare it with the runtime as, as the Ewald message passing gives us. Um, 
Also what you see on OC20 as well as on OC6 tools that simply increasing the size of the embeddings has essentially no effect. The embedding increase was done as much to get uh, roughly the same number of free parameters as, as with EVAD message passing, of course. So we see that it's not the additional three parameters that leads to the improvements. Um, and then on OS62, the picture is a bit more diverse. So here indeed the, the other variants do work sometimes. For instance, if we look at the increased cutoff variant, this does work well for the edge-based models. Apparently they do have some way of better incorporating this, this increased model cutoff and kind of learning uh, information, learning to propagate information with this larger cutoff. However, it is even detrimental for the simpler node-based models of uh, PyNN and Schnett. So really diverse result here. And the same, but oppositely holds true for our variant where we just put a larger cut of Schnett block on top of the remaining model instead of an Ewald block. Here you can see that, the, um, that it does work well for the, for the, for the node, for, for, for the edge base, um, it does work well for the node-based models. However, it does almost no difference um, for the for the edge-based models of Dynet plus plus and Gemnet T. And in fact, you cannot uh, increase the cost more. So maybe you might ask, okay, so why didn't you just do an even larger cutoff? Perhaps get more cost, uh, more like the Ewald message passing, but also perhaps better results. The point is that on the OE62 data set, um, most structures are already saturated completely by the 12 Angstrom cutoff. So the graph already has essentially full connectivity on almost every structure and increasing the cutoff even further doesn't increase the cost anymore. So as we see, Ewald message passing is the only reliable way of getting improvements that works across all structures. And what you also see is that you get a very small overhead by using Ewald message passing. It's it's often below a single millisecond. And this means um, that it's also smaller than, than many differences between model baselines, especially on OC20. So it is quite a cheap way in which you can achieve very reliable uh, improvements um, in the tested cases. So we do recommend putting it on top of your models if you think that long range interactions might be relevant in your data. Then, of course, we also wanted to see whether it's really long range uh, interactions that Ewald message passing corrects, um, because this, this uh, well, it's more of a hypothesis so far. Um, and of course, there's no definite way of saying this because you can just look inside our, our model as in any more interpretive method. method. Um, but what you can see um, here in our study is the following. We looked at three different variants of each model again. So we have our standard baselines, then we have baselines with Ewald message passing on top. And as a third variant, we looked at the baseline plus a sort of, um, well, it's kind of a cheating baseline really, because what it does is it just gets the D3 correction that explicitly uh, amounts for the van der Waals energy in the system. It gets this thing added on top of the remaining model prediction. So it doesn't really have to learn this. It only has to learn all the more short range contributions, which do not include Van der Waals effects. And we compare these sort of three variants, so baseline, baseline plus Ewald, and the cheating baseline that gets the Van der Waals energy on top of their predictions. And the idea is now to group all the OE62 structures into bins of roughly equal size, which are according to the magnitude of their um, D3 correction. So, uh, and what we do then is, is we, we collect the statistics, so the mean and the confidence intervals of the energy errors in each of those bins, and you clearly see that Ewald message passing strongly correlates. Uh, so the correction by Ewald message passing strongly correlates with the um, magnitude of the D3 correction. And Ewald message passing leads to larger corrections on these structures, which have a lot of van der Waals contributions. And you can even see that Ewald message passing surpasses uh, this effect uh, when compared to the cheating baseline, uh, which, which doesn't have to predict van der Waals interactions at all. This basically means that it also that it doesn't just accommodate for van der Waals interactions. It also learns other things which improve energy predictions. I think this is quite clear. Uh, but importantly, you see that Ewald message passing recovers the effects of uh, van der Waals correction. However, without any hand crafting, it can just learn the same thing uh, simply looking at the data. Um, and then 
as a final study, um, or not a study, but generally regarding our results. So far, I've only talked about energies, but what about forces? Of course, we have these targets as well on the OC20 data. And what you see in general is that EVA message passing also leads to robust force improvements across our different models. However, they are smaller than for the energy. And this is, uh, first of all, an observation. Um, there we do have an explanation for this, however, uh, which is that forces are really gradients of the potential energy. So there, you can see it below in this formula here, they're, they're the negative gradients of the potential energy uh, with respect to the atomic positions. And if you now expand this potential energy in Fourier space and you compute this gradient in Fourier space, then you can see that you get this additional factor of, of I times K on, in front of it. So essentially it means that compared to the energy, the forces are much more dominated by high wavelength terms rather than low wavelength terms. And this in turn means that these are exactly the terms which are not addressed by Ewald message passing because Ewald message passing focuses on the, long, on the, on the low wavelength terms this is uh, what is included within our frequency cutoff. So it doesn't hurt forces. It leads to small improvements, but, but Ewald message passing is really more of an energy correction scheme than a force correction scheme, at least from what we've seen on our data so far. So this is uh, what I wanted to report regarding results. You can, of course, also find this in the paper. Now, just uh, to really take a step back and look at what we've shown so far, so we have this analogy, this physically informed analogy between message sums uh, in convolutional filter message passing and sums over physical potentials. And really this analogy informs very naturally a new kind of message passing scheme that is non-local, it works in Fourier space, and it has these new types of representations, uh, which we call structure factor embeddings, which are really equivalent to the collection of atom embeddings plus the atom positions. Also, we see empirically that Ewald message passing is very inexpensive computationally, and it's also agnostic to the choice of um, baseline model. You can really put it on top of different models in much the same way. So it can be used as a plug and play addition to existing models. It, it's very easy to integrate, and, and it's a great way to test how to even get about a bit more performance out of your models regarding energy predictions than you have uh, without Ewald message passing. And finally, our results also give a good indication that Ewald message passing indeed targets long-range interactions in the system. Uh, specifically, we showed that it does correct for van der Waals interactions. It might, of course, now be interesting to see if this also works if the ground truth includes much more complex van der Waals contributions, for instance, something from fully non-local density functional theory functionals. So, there, um, this is much more costly than just computing the degree correction. And it might be interesting to see if Ewald message passing also learns that. Yes, so this is uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Now it's of course time for further questions or perhaps previous questions if you still have them. So um, yes, please go ahead. Excellent. So do you think your method or the Ewald message passing is more valuable if we're talking about um, proteins or very large molecules? Ah, okay. So this is, of course, a bit of a different field because I assume, I mean, I'm not an expert in this in this area, but I assume that you're not working on an atomistic level anymore, right? So you cause grain and look at things like uh, amino acids as the individual sort of elementary blocks. Um, yeah, let's say we do that. Sorry, say it again? Yeah, let's say we do that. Yes. Uh, so of course, um, this this does get a bit more um, remote from from just uh, the sum of atom wise interactions, but I do think that this could be could be attempted with with proteins as well. I do think uh, just from a scaling point of view that Ewald summation will uh, lead to better um, performance uh, with with increasing structural size. Um, this is actually I haven't talked about this yet, but the scaling uh, there was also the question. So if you just would look at an atom to atom message passing without distance cutoff, then of course you have a quadratic scaling, right? Because you have to pass messages between every pair of atoms in the structure. And Ewald message passing allows to go below this quadratic scaling. Um, and it's really, it's a bit less, less simple than it might seem. Um, 
but so let me maybe get back to the slide here uh, with the long range message sum. So actually this does have, well, naively it would have linear scaling, right? Because you, you have to sum over all the supercell atoms, but the amount of, of, of frequencies is constant. Uh, if you leave the, the atom cutoff constant, this is actually not quite true because if you increase the structural size, then the reciprocal lattice, uh, so if you increase the supercell size, then the reciprocal lattice will correspondingly shrink down. And in fact, the number of K vectors um, inside any fixed uh, K space volume is in fact proportional to the structural size. So, so you would have a quadratic scaling if you just do vanilla sort of Ebert message passing with a fixed frequency cutoff, but you can get to a better scaling if you, um, if you look at uh, how you could vary this frequency cutoff with increasing structural size. You could, for instance, vary the cutoff like one over n when n is the structural size, and then you, of course, have a linear scaling. So really, it's, it's not as much a scaling thing as, as much you really want to have in the sum. Um, and, and you can flexibly adapt your scaling just by the way you vary your cutoff with the structural size. Uh, of course, if you vary your, if you make your frequency cutoff too small, this might lead to a certain gap of let's call it mid-range interactions that that sort of are neither covered by the distance cutoff nor the frequency cutoff. But in general, you you do have better scaling properties than distance-based message passing uh, without cutoff. So yeah, coming back to a question, of course. Um, so. Because of the scaling aspect, I do think that uh, better performance can even be expected once we look at larger data sets. 200 atoms is, of course, nothing for molecular dynamic standards. Really, we're talking about systems with 100 million atoms that are often interesting for, for soft matter people, for example. And it might be very useful to test how well eval message passing performs in the setting. Um, and yeah, I think proteins might be might be such such an example of really large systems where about message passing might become really handy. So you also now talked about um, maybe in some cases it is not just this easy multiplicative um, contribution that you can that can come in. So what if you just do something stupid like um, you sum up your stuff? You concatenate some embedding of the uh, you concatenate some embedding of the the frequencies um, of the frequency cutoffs and uh, or no some embedding of the frequency magnitudes and then you just feed that through another linear layer and then um, you use that like not using uh, the output of phi tilde l. Uh, just in a multiplicative way, just yeah, do whatever you want. Yeah, okay, so this multiplicative structure is important if you want your predictions to be translationally invariant, um, because this has to do okay. with, with the way convolutions look like in Fourier space. So a position space convolution is, is of course, not, uh, it, it doesn't change when you translate the system because the convolution with the filter just depends on the relative position of atoms, right? So, so continuous filter convolutions are, of course, translationally invariant. And in Fourier space, this convolution simply becomes a pointwise multiplication. This is generally how convolutions look like in Fourier space. And this is really, so this translational invariance that we get to convolutions informs this pointwise multiplication structure that we have in Fourier space. And we could, in theory, do something more stupid, perhaps, but it's important that we cannot really let different k vectors interact, different structure vector embeddings mm -hmm. interact with each other. It has to be a pointwise operation on the structure vector embeddings. And then I think we should, in general, be translationally variant. But really, there isn't that much freedom uh, of what we can do in Fourier space without sacrificing the translational invariance. Yeah, OK. Then, very nice. Let's maybe go to the results slides. Are you a bit sad about these um, results on the, if we use the good networks like GemNet and so on for the OE62 um, benchmark, for example, then we are really, there doesn't seem to be a difference. And of, yeah, the, so, and then on OC20, we have, 
the results for um, for pain that don't really look so much different if we just increase the 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 cutoff. Um, so on OC twin, okay. So let's go to OC sixty two first. Yeah. Well, what I mean, what what said? I think I'm really happy that our method uh, works in general. That it always leads to improvements, and never really is surpassed by these other improvements. I think the important point uh, that I want to make here is that evac message passing never leads uh, to anything detrimental. And it's always the most robust method here, at least in the in the settings that we studied. So, so for instance, if you take an increased cutoff, right? It, it, does, it does work almost exactly like evac message passing when you look at the runtime trade-off. Uh, so in the OE62 case, for, for Dynet and Gemnet, it does work really, it does the same like, like eval message passing. So that's, that's, that's of course um, good uh, to see, um, but, but then again, it does something very different for, for, for the, for the node-based models. So it really hurts the performance. It actually hurts it extremely much in the case of Schnett. So, I mean, if you have a lot of time to experiment around, then of course, feel free to, to try these different things uh, as we did. But at least from our data, it appears that eval message passing is, is the most, most uh, safe method to really get an improvement uh, that is robust um, in terms uh, of models as well as studied data sets. And on OC20, um, I mean, I'm not sure what, what exactly you meant there. So you said that the cutoff setting is similar to eval, but I think this is only really true for the, for the Schnett model. Here indeed, the cutoff does produce quite the same trade-off as evad message passing, but it's it's really much more it's really much worse when you compare it uh, with with the other models, and particularly for the for the much better models like Dynet and Gemnet that are the better models to use on 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 a dataset like OC20. You see that an increased cutoff makes all, almost no difference when you compare yeah. it. To evad message passing. I, I think we've looked enough at the results. Yes, but, sure. Yeah. Um, cool. So also write your, it's just, I find it very nice that basically you don't have to change anything with your existing models. You can just add this thing. Um, yeah. All right. Then I would say, uh, oh no, let's maybe say to finish off the day, do you have some future future directions or future improvements or also can also be a completely different topic that you, you're excited about and that you want to mention and that you want to advertise to the world? Oh, so I don't know, like there's, I think there's many ways in which this can be, can be continued. Uh, for instance, we only looked really at the standard eval summation uh, with, with the standard Fourier transform. But if you look at the eval summation literature, there has of course been a lot of advancement methods which use the fast Fourier transform in order to get down to an n log n scaling of the method. Um, so, so really you could think of numerical improvements that you could use in order to make eval message passing even better, better in terms of scaling. Uh, because right now the good scaling is only there because you have to decrease the frequency cutoff when you increase structural size. But eval summation really offers ways of in, in increasing the scaling, improving the scaling without having to, to do such things. Um, so this would be, I think, a very interesting direction, direction to look forward to. Also, we've only looked at node-based models uh, and, and invariant models. Of course, you could, in principle, use those concepts in, 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 in combination with equivariants. You could think of equivariant versions of evad, of evad message passing. You could think of, OK, how could I maybe do an edge message passing that also looks like evad summation? There are many different ways of how this method could be extended, but much more important than methodic advancements, I think, is really looking how well this performs on different data. So our work primarily focused on introducing the method and showing on simple benchmark that it does work and it doesn't do something stupid. But of course, it would be very interesting now to look at, at what you said, for instance, with proteins or with other systems. So for instance, uh, also surface physics, uh, colloid physics, um, these sort of settings um, that really where long range interactions do play a very important role, particularly electrostatics, and and they don't just cancel out. So so these are settings where I do think evad message passing might become very interesting to try. So really a lot of data focused work 
rather than model focused work that that would also be interested uh, with our method i'm yeah. i'm sure that would be very interesting and um i would like to see those results very much as well but uh, <laughs> i have the the rough suspicion that the speed at which this will be happening uh, might be much lower if you do not uh, push this and participate in this and maybe oh, yes. Of course, I, I am planning to push this further. Uh, I do think it would be quite a shame not to not to continue this work um, because it does really offer a lot of follow-up opportunities. But uh, I'm very interested in, in collaboration. So if you have ideas of how event message passing could be used, uh, either in a data-focused uh, perspective or in a model-focused perspective, just um, get, get to me and I would be very interested to discuss this. I am really a big fan of this paper, and I agree with Arthur that it would be fantastic to see people applying eval based message passing to larger systems and to just a more a bigger diversity of systems. And if you do that, then please let me know. I, I want I would be the first one to be very excited about it. All right. And if you want to join the future reading group sessions, everything is in the description, also with information for our Slack, where you can, for example, recommend papers for the next session. See you.